Hi, I'm Nicole. Thank you for joining us. Two quick things. We would love to connect with you and hear your story. Send us an email at share at bbf.org or write us on Facebook. Also, if you would like to know what's going on here at BBF or partner with us financially, please visit our website at bbf.org. We hope you enjoy the message. What are you doing? I know. What have you been doing to your brother? I know. You don't know? I just grabbed him. You were scrubbing him? Yeah. Oh, Ethan. <laughs> Hi. I knew you two must have been getting into something, but I just didn't imagine it would be this. Oh. <laughs> Does it feel good? Uh. Yeah. We have to go give you a bath now. Oh. Emily, no more. Okay. No more. Okay, bye-bye. Let's go take a bath, okay? I'm going to take a bath on my hands. On your hands? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm going to take a bath. <laughs> oh, okay, let's come see this side. This is another view. Oh, you're beautiful. It's just on me. Emily, you're an artist. But let's not do this again, okay? This is not something we should repeat. Do that to me. Do what to you? This. I'm taking your picture. Okay. Tell me what you did to Ethan. A tummy. What did you do on his tummy? His belly. What, what, what did you put on his belly? I butter on it. You put butter on him? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh Okay, that's enough. Bye bye. Bye bye. But it's time to grow up. But it's time to grow up. But everybody gonna, everybody gonna grow up. Grow up. So, how's Bakersfield doing tonight? Good? Yeah, my name is Pastor Jim, and that was the infamous peanut butter baby. How many, how many of you have already seen that video? Now, what was funny is uh, I was talking to my kids, and, and they said, Dad, this video went viral, and there's songs to this baby uh, and everything. And so if you want to have some fun after church tonight, Google peanut butter baby song compilation, and uh, you'll be entertained. But uh, there, there's a reason why I wanted to play that video, and it's not just because it's funny, and I do think it is funny, and I think when we come to church, we should be able to laugh, right? You should be able to have a good time. How many of you need to laugh a little bit extra tonight because of things that you're going through? And see, Pastor Ron has, has really built this into the VBF culture from years and years ago, and that is church should be a place where we get serious with God, but we have a good time doing it, right? And uh, so I want to say hello uh, to everyone that is tuning in online. You're missing out on the fun here live on the campus. And so if you're in Bakersfield, shame on you, all right? Unless you're at the Northwest campus, then we're uh, excited about that. So hello to all those guys over there on uh, Coffee Road, uh, hanging out our, at our uh, Northwest building. But uh, we... Um, we're in a series at the new campus in Thousand Oaks. We're going through the book of James and we're talking about spiritual maturity. And I just love that video. Uh, I, it kind of reminded me of my kids growing up. Uh, it's hard to believe that my middle daughter is 21 years old today. It's her birthday. All right. So a uh, little shout out to Mackenzie. Or as like, uh, she likes to be called Kenzie, not Mackenzie, but uh, dad calls her Mackenzie. And, and as, as I was thinking about peanut butter baby, I mean, we've had those moments growing up, but probably the time that I most remember uh, a, a child just kind of following the whim and, and the impulse, right? So if you have kids, you know, if they go in the other room and it's quiet, you better check on them because they're probably getting into trouble. 
And I remember still in high school, uh, my sister was visiting us with her boys, and her boys were little. But I remember waking up, it was like two in the morning, I heard a noise, and and so I get up and I go into the kitchen where I hear the noise coming from, and my three-year-old little nephew had pulled up a chair to the counter in the kitchen. And he had grabbed an orange. And all I see is the biggest knife I think we owned. And he had it in his hand and he was about ready to slice the orange, probably slice his hand off in the process. And he is just going down for it. And I was like, Jacob, what are you doing? And he about jumped out of his skin. uh, you know, he knew, like, his, the jig was up, man. He, I, was, I was finding him out. But I was thinking about, it, like, what, what was it, like, th- you know, when he was three years old, he was laying down, uh, and in the middle of the night, I don't know where my sister was, she was sound asleep, and, and he just thought he was hungry for an orange. And he'd seen us make oranges, and he said, I just need to grab a knife, and hey, the bigger the knife, the quicker I'll get to my orange, I guess. Uh, but uh, that was kind of a God story, too, because um, my, my nephew still has his hand uh, to this day, uh, thanks to Uncle Jim, all right? But I, I, don't, I don't know if you can relate uh, to my nephew if you've had a whim or an impulse that came across uh, you when you were little that you just kind of gave yourself over to, whether it was slathering yourself with peanut butter or maybe, uh, you know, giving your younger sister uh, or brother a haircut. How many gave a haircut to your sibling? All right, come on, haircutters, all right. Um, You know, they had the bangs to prove it for like a month. I was the youngest, so I was the one that always was getting the, uh, the short end of the deal. But uh, I remember uh, Josiah when he was, I think he was like maybe three or four. And, and as a parent, you want to protect your kids. And so you're there as a means to make sure that your kid becomes an adult. And so you have to intervene sometimes when that impulse comes in or that whim comes in that would put him in harm's way. And Josiah, he had this habit when he would get out of the car, he'd like to run. And so we would have to hold him, you know, by the hand and say, you know, we're going to walk because these cars can't see you, bud. So we got to walk to the store. And one time he just got tired of us having to hold his hand. And so he grabbed his hand out of my hand. And I said, bud, you can't, we can't walk. You can't walk. You have to hold daddy's hand. He said, I'm going to hold my own hand. And so he proceeded to try to walk to the front of the store holding his own hand because he thought the whole reason uh, we were trying to hold his hand, I don't know, for, you know, wasn't to protect him. Uh, but see, God has built inside of us the capacity to know if something's dangerous or not, whether we should do it or not. But here's what you need to understand for your spiritual maturity is that part of that component inside of you is broken. And so there are these impulses and these things that just pop up. And and even as an adult that you think, well, I I kind of feel like doing this, so I'm just going to do this. And even though you intuitively know if you do this, it's going to hurt you, it's going to hurt your loved ones, it could possibly even kill you, you still end up doing it. And the Bible has a word for this, it's called temptation. And the book of James talks a lot about temptation because you see the early church, uh, they were going through their own struggle and this letter that James writes to the early church is like, hey, I know you guys are discouraged. I know you guys are, are out there trying to live this faith in Jesus, but I, I've got to address some issues because you guys are not maturing like you're supposed to. And last week we talked about this idea of trials or problems that come in our life. And and problems come in our life and, and God uses those problems to help bring about spiritual maturity. 
And last week, if you were here, you, you know, I mean, we all have problems. So it was a message that you probably identified with and you, you thought to yourself, man, this really speaks to me because I have problems in my life. But I, I think just like last week where problems talk to everybody, I think this week talking about temptation is also going to speak to everybody because here's the truth about you. You struggle with temptation. There are things that are presented to you and to your flesh that you know you shouldn't do, but there is this little struggle, and sometimes it's an enormous struggle going on inside of you saying, I know that's not good for me, and I know not, that's not profitable for me, but I still want to do it. And, and so there's that little three-year-old inside of all of us that even though we know we shouldn't do this, it, it, there's this impulse, there's this drive to do it anyway. James addresses this issue because spiritual growth is predicated on you resisting and overcoming the temptations that find their way into your life. And so if you have your Bible, let's, let's read together. James chapter 1 is where I, I want to highlight a couple of verses uh, from the book of James. And we're going to kind of jump around a little bit. And, and so you can kind of follow along with us. And it said, And remember when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong. And he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires. Where does tempca- temptation come from, church? From your own desires, very good, which entice us and drag us away. So temptations come in your life and they have an agenda for you. They want to drag you away. They want to pull you away from living out the life that God wants you to live out. They want to sabotage the process of you reaching the promise of God for your life. That's why they're there. They're going to drag you away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens, and he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Now, I want to highlight a couple things with this or with these scriptures, uh, with these verses. The first thing is this. He says, temptations grow and become something that can kill you. Sin and these desires that, that uh, you know, produce the sin, then produce death. It gives birth to death. One of the saddest moments as a pastor that I've ever experienced, and I've experienced a lot, was seeing a young couple that were friends of Tara and I's uh, get pregnant with their first baby and all the way up to the time that they're about ready to have the baby. This is like, I think she was maybe 36 weeks. So, I mean, the baby could be born, be healthy, but the baby wasn't quite ready yet. And they were involved in an auto accident and, uh, there wasn't a major injury in the auto accident. Uh, and so they were, you know, looked at, she was examined, the baby, you know, was examined, uh, you know, the heartbeat and all of that, and they were released. And that weekend, after the accident, she noticed that the baby stopped moving. And so she went back in to be checked again, and they couldn't find a heartbeat. Somehow, in that auto accident that happened on Friday, did some damage to the baby where the baby ended up dying over the weekend. And so here was this precious young couple, friends, close friends to Tara and I, that have just lived about nine months of their life excited, anticipating the birth of their firstborn baby. I mean, you know, at this point, the nursery set, the baby showers have, have, have uh, been done. I mean, they are ready for the baby with excitement. And then we get this news, the baby is gone. And so they have to go ahead and give birth to the baby still. And, and so we get word of this and we're down at the hospital and Pastor Ron's there and a bunch of uh, our friends were there. And I mean, we are praying for a miracle. We're praying that God would resurrect this baby in the womb. And we're believing for God to do it. But the baby is born and this precious little girl isn't alive. We know she's in heaven 
But I have to tell you, that was one of the saddest moments that I've ever had as a pastor, watching this young couple that were just days before this filled with excitement and, and just thrilled with this baby that was gonna come to be holding their baby who was no longer there but was in heaven. And, and it's kind of a, a graphic picture that James is writing here. He says, sin is very much like this. It's got all these promises and all this excitement you just get you know, like, oh, wow, this is going to be the best thing for me. And, and then you get all excited, you get ramped up, and then you, you give birth to this thing that you think is going to be this exciting moment or, or this, this wonderful uh, event for your life. And, and it actually feels like death. All of this excitement that it promised, it never delivers. Matter of fact, it delivers the opposite. It delivers something that's dead. And some of you that have given yourself over to these impulses, that you've given yourself over to these whim, whims that, that just kind of happen. James says, when you give yourself over like that, it, 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 it gives birth to death. Now, some of you, maybe you've been wrestling with some issues this week and you've been thinking about going back and doing things again. And see, you know, the devil is good about coming in our life and, and reminding us of the kick, but making us forget the kick back because sin always has a kickback in a bad way. It kicks your back really bad. But we have this short-term memory problem and we just, we forget that part of it. But sin always leads to death, James says. And he says, what you need to understand is that God is good. And so there was this kind of this mentality that was leaking in to the church. That these desires are there. These impulses are there because God made us that way. And so if we want to be true to God and who God has made us to be, then we must follow these impulses. And James is like, whoa, 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 whoa. You need to understand, my friend, that those impulses are broken. And if you just follow every wind that comes in your way, you're gonna end up dying an early death. He says, God doesn't bring you these things that bring death, God brings you things that bring life. He's a good God. Touch your neighbor and say, he's a good God. And a good God wants to give you good things for your life. And sin does the opposite. Sin brings death. And so James is like, don't ever confuse your good God with, with your broken impulses. Because they're not the same. He says, your good God that has good things in store for you actually has built inside of you the ability now through his spirit to resist those urges and impulses that want to carry you away and kill the dreams and the promises that God has waiting for your future. He says he, he, he wants to help you with that. And the reason the Bible tells us these commands and says avoid doing these things, uh, stay away from these things, it's not that God is a killjoy and he's like, hey, I don't, I don't want my creation to have any fun whatsoever. I, I, I want to get them, uh, you know, just, just away from having any, any kind of fun at all. No, anytime you read in the Bible where God says don't do something, I want you to do what somebody told me to do years ago and that is insert don't hurt yourself. So anytime God says, don't do this, I, I want you to put in there, don't hurt yourself. Because why? God is telling you to stay away from these things because if you give yourself over to those things, those very same things will end up destroying you, your family, and your life. So don't hurt yourself. Don't give yourself over to these things. Because in the end, it, it's going to kill you. And let me tell you something, church. I have done way too many funerals for teenagers and 20-somethings in this church that have come to these services that had a moment where they gave themselves over to an impulse and it cost them their life. I had to get up here with moms and dads and brothers and sisters and I had to do a funeral because these people in one moment gave themselves over to impulse and it robbed them and stripped them of their life. It can happen to any of you. And I don't want to do your funeral 
because you had a moment where you decided to give into that urge or give into that impulse that actually ended up taking your life. Don't be foolish. It happens all the time. And James is saying here, you need to identify where those urges and impulses are coming from because they're not coming from God. I don't care what this world tells you. I don't care what this culture tells you. There are impulses in you. Don't just say, God just made me this way. No, there are impulses and urges and desires inside of you that are just set to try to pull you away from the promises that God has for you. Now check out what it says in in chapter four. It says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? I, I love this verse because... There are problems in our relationships because of these things that are inside of us. You may have friction in a relationship in your life, not because maybe that person, there's something wrong with that person. James is saying, no, there may be something wrong inside of you, and then that indirectly caused friction in the relationship. Saying, if you want to fix that relationship, It starts with looking at the desires inside of you and see how you're doing taking care of those desires. Taking, making sure that God is helping you take care of those desires inside of you. Now, let let me give you a a verse or some verses from Colossians because here's here's the truth. Even after you get saved, even after Jesus Christ comes into your life, it doesn't mean that temptation is erased and you never have to face temptation again. Matter of fact, in some cases, when you become born again, when the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you, in some ways, temptation gets ramped up. Why? Because now you are on the course to doing miracles for God's kingdom with your life. And nothing will sabotage you being able to be used as a conduit of heaven more than you giving yourself over to temptations. So in some ways, because you are a follower of God, the devil comes in and starts exploiting some of these broken desires inside of you and says, give yourself over to these things. But listen to what Paul says in the, to the Colossian church. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. In in other words, you you have the ability to, to do these things. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. Can can I say that one more time? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. There are things that God is saying, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You should walk away from these things. And you still have the ability to give yourself over to these things. But if you really want to walk in the power of God moving in your life, then you should take note and practice overcoming your temptation. You don't have to give yourself over to these things. Paul says, put them away and rid yourselves of these these things. He wouldn't tell you to do that if it weren't possible. Say, well, then how is it possible? How do I get to a position where I, I can overcome these temptations? And let me tell you something. Temptations, even though we all struggle with them, we all struggle with different ones. So the person sitting next to you may struggle with impulses that, that you don't share. And they may tell you like, man, I really struggle with this. And you're like, man, I don't get that at all. But let me tell you, I struggle with it. And they're like, man, that's that's weird. Uh, But the bottom line is we, we all share temptation, but they're all a little different. But the Bible gives us the keys to overcoming temptation. Now there's a biblical, there's biblical PowerPoints I'm gonna go over tonight, but I, I wanna give you not just a biblical, but the practical PowerPoints that I've seen God use in my life to help me personally overcome temptation in my life. So they're biblical and practical. So I want you to write these down and, and start learning how to apply them to your life so that you can walk as an overcomer instead of always being overcome by the temptation. So, so here we go. Are you, are you ready, church? All right? Touch your neighbor say, are you ready? All right. It says here, submit to God. Submit to God. Now, 
This kind of is a uh, generic PowerPoint, but it's a powerful PowerPoint and one that many Christians aren't living by. And there's a verse in chapter four that says, submit therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And a lot of people, when they start following Christ, or when they, they, they become born again, they focus on this idea of like, I got to resist the devil, man. God wants me to be a good Christian, so I'm going to resist the devil. And my friend, I, I commend you for doing that, but it's not just about resisting the devil. Matter of fact, the more important part of that sentence is the part that's before the resisting the devil part, and that is submitting to God. Now, this is a military term. When Paul is writing it, this is, this is uh, or uh, James is writing this, this is a military term that's saying getting your proper rank. Now, if you've served in the military, you know that if you're a private and your sergeant comes, you Yes, sir, right? Yes, sergeant, no sergeant. It, you know, and if you're a sergeant and then, and then the captain comes and then the major comes and then the general comes, I mean, you have proper ranks within the military and what James is saying here, if you really want to learn how to overcome temptation, uh, overcome this temptation, it's learning to be in proper rank to God. See, a lot of people miss this because a lot of people say yes to Jesus and they make Jesus a part of their lives. But they don't line Jesus up as the captain of their lives, as the commander of their lives. And there's a difference of having Jesus part of your life and, and having Jesus as the commander of your lives. That's why I don't like the term Christian because the term Christian is too generic for me. And you ask an American if they're a Christian, they're gonna say yes. But if you start talking this way, saying, are you a follower of Jesus? Then that's, it, it sounds different. A follower of Jesus is somebody, guess what, that has a leader named Jesus that they're going after. A Christian just like, yeah, you know, I have God in my life. It's too generic. See, some of you, I'm telling you, your breakdown is the fact that you just have Jesus a part of your life, like you have football, like you have Krispy Kreme, like you have your job, like you have your money, like you have your family, and Jesus didn't come into your life just to be another part. Jesus came into your life so that he can be your leader, your commander, your captain, your king. And when you start living your life as Jesus, living as your commander, then things are different. Because you don't do what you want to do anymore because you're getting your, your plans. You're, you're, you're getting your commands from your commander. I know what I want to do, Commander Jesus, but what do you want me to do today? And can you imagine how radically different your life would look if every day when you're waking up, you're saying... Here I am, Private Jim Cruz reporting for duty. What would you have me do today? Or I should say, what would you have me not do today? <laughs> right? And then Jesus is going to be there leading your life. And it's going to be a lot easier to overcome temptation when you're not the one in charge. Hey, you should do this. The devil gets in your head. Yeah, you should do this. Say, hey, that's not my call. I'm not in charge anymore. Jesus, what would you have to say for me doing this? No? All right. Hey, thought bubble in my head. That's a no. Because why? Because my commander, my captain Jesus said, don't do that. That wouldn't be healthy for me. That, that will pull me away from the, the miracles and the promises that God wants to bring into my life for my future. So those things are going to pull me away from God, not push me and propel me towards God. So the answer is no. It, this is a radical shift in how we believe. Because James talks about being double-minded. He talks about being double-minded in this verse in chapter four. He also talks about being double-minded in chapter one. You, you've heard the old African proverb, he who has his feet in two boats will split his pants. <laughs> I just made that up. All right. Um, but there's this idea of 
I, I want God in my life, but I also want this other stuff. You go nowhere. Matter of fact, it's, it's a horrible way to live. I lived that way in my Christianity for the first five years of professing faith in Jesus. I didn't have him as my commander. And I had a weak, powerless faith. So when temptation came in my life, there was no way to fight against it. Because I had a form of godliness, but I was denying the power of God. The power of God comes in your life when you are in full submission to God in your life. That's, that's what I discovered. So for the first five years, it was, it was just kind of a blasé existence where I had church on Sunday, but I had the world Monday through Saturday. That was my life. And I would get frustrated when I come to church because I, I was like, I know I shouldn't be doing these things. And so I would cry and I would repent and then Friday would roll around again and that guy inside of me going, hey, let's go party. You know, he'd pull me away again. And what, where was the struggle based at? The struggle was based at Jesus was just a part of Jim like everything else and he wasn't commanding me. He wasn't, he wasn't leading me. See, so many of us, we want God to do big things in our life. And, and, and we're just waiting for that big moment like, God, you're, I want to, I, what is your will for my life? See, as you are submitting to God daily, it's going to fill your life up with so much fun because you just never know what God's going to do, whether he's going to have you pray for a family member, if he's going to have you feed a homeless guy, if, if he's going to maybe have you share your faith with a classmate or a coworker. You just don't know. You're just like, it's a fun way to live. But see, as God uses you each and every day, and as you are obedient to following him on a daily basis, you will eventually accomplish the will that he has for your life on a life basis. So learn how to be obedient today and your obedience today will tee you up and set you up for his will to be done for your life in all of your tomorrows. It starts with obedience today. It starts with you making a decision today to say, Jesus, you're my commander. You're not just part of my life. You're the captain of my life. If you want to overcome sin, if you want to overcome temptation, then submit to God. Second is feed the Spirit. Feed the Spirit. Now this is an important principle because you have a war going on inside of you. I don't know if somebody's ever told you that, but certainly you've been feeling that, especially if you're a follower of Jesus and you've invited the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you, you know that you just feel sometimes this wrestling match. Maybe even this morning when you woke up and there's this wrestling match going on inside you, you go, man, I need to pray. But there's something inside you going, man, don't pray. Just sleep in 15 more minutes. And you're like, no, I need to get up and I need to pray. And there's like, no, don't worry about it, bro. Just kick back, you know? You got a long day, you need your rest. And that you know, and then there's this internal like, like wrestling match going on. How many know that wrestling match? And it's just going on, whether it's like, like what you should do in the morning to like whether you should look at that person that you're not married to, or, or maybe it's you know, to, to talk about somebody you know you shouldn't be talking about. And you got this thing going on inside of you. You go, man, what is going on? Galatians, the book of Galatians talks about this struggle, talks about this war. In chapter five, it says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Remember, that's what James said it was, your desires, your impulses. He says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. In other words, if you are feeding the spirit of God inside of you, when the temptation comes, that spirit man, that spirit woman inside of you, I mean, it's, it's pumped. I mean, it, it's taken the pre-workout. It's got the protein going. It's like, bring it. I'm ready for you. And before that temptation is even able to like come out and say, all right, let's, let's do this. Your spirit, the spirit of God inside of you has already got that desire in a headlock and that desire is tapping out. 
but you have to be intentional to make sure that spirit man, that spirit woman has been given the nourishment and been given all the things it needs in order to win those battles that rage every day of your lives. So here's the question. How are you doing and feeding the spirit of God inside of you? How healthy is the spirit of God inside of you? Is he strong? Is he ready to fight any fleshly desires that come your way? Or is he anemic and weak because he hasn't been fed? He's been starving and, and, and you know, the desire comes out and says, hey, I'm, I'm going to get you. And, and the spirit of God is just so weak and pathetic, just, just laying there, dormant. And Galatians says, if you want the spirit of God to have the victory over the desires of your flesh, then you have to be proactive in making sure the spirit of God is being nourished in your life. Now, how do we do that here as a church? Well, let me give you these three so you can write these down. The first way we help feed your spirit is we have gatherings like this on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings. And when you come here, we're praying that God would inspire you by his word so that you'll be encouraged to go out there and live more for God than you did when you came in. And for the most part, that always happens when you show up, right? That's why I tell people, hey, I know sometimes you don't feel like coming here, but just showing up is half the battle. So when you show up, you're already halfway to your victory. Come on, somebody, that's, that's good. You need to know that. You're halfway to your victory just by being here. And when you leave here, how many times have you left here going, man, I am so glad I came. Man, I am... I, Man, I can't believe I was stupid for a minute and I thought I was, I'm going to stay home and watch a basketball game tonight. Like, that was dumb, man. I, I feel like, man, I am, I am on fire for God. I feel like God just, just like reconnected me and, and, and reignited me. And I'm ready, man, I'm, I'm ready to go and, and talk to my, my family tonight about God. I'm, I'm ready to go and rededicate my marriage back to God. I mean, that's why we say don't miss and forsake the gathering together. And I, and I know some of you that are watching at home, you don't have that ability. But that's why we also really, you know, g- give you encouragement to get involved in a life group. Now, this is a little different than these big gatherings like this, but a life group is still going to help inspire you and encourage the Spirit of God inside of you. Because, uh, and, and a lot of times in the circles, it's, a, it's a, a lot more powerful because you're dealing with more of a, like a one-on-one basis with other people. So people are able to lay hands on you and say, hey, I just want to right now, I just want to pray for you. And, I, and, and we all want to just gather around you and pray because we know you're struggling like that. It, it's hard, harder to do that in a bigger setting like this. So get into a life group is my point. And so I don't know what life group to join. Go into the lobby. And, and say, hey, give me your list of life groups and, and we'll make sure we get you one. You know, just gathering in a circle of people, whether it's at a home, whether it's at a Starbucks, whether it's at the man cave, whether it's at the women cave, I don't know what you guys call it here, but um, whatever, wh- whatever it is, just circling up with other people is going to be beneficial for you because it's gonna be helping you feed the spirit. Here, here's the second thing we do besides just the gathering together is worship. Worship is warfare for the Spirit of God living inside of you. So when you are singing the songs of God, songs of praise, songs of worship, what you're doing is you're igniting the presence of God in your life. And and so... I know, I, I, I like all kinds of music, I, and, and I don't want to be up here and make it sound like I listen to worship music all the time because, man, I like a good 80s jam every once in a while. But, but let me tell you, my spirit feels different when I'm filling myself with Hillsong versus when I'm filling myself with Van Halen, all right? You know what I'm talking about. You know, Van Halen is fun sometimes because it reminds me of my upbringing and being a a kid of the 80s. But when I'm listening to Hillsong, I'm being brought into the presence of God. And and the presence of God is, is doing something inside of me. 
And it's so much easier to overcome temptation when you're in the presence of God than when you're giving yourself over to the desires of your flesh. So worship is warfare for you overcoming the temptation and feeding the spirit. And, and here's the third part, and these are, this is probably the most significant one, and that is being in the word of God, the Bible. Knowing the word of God, reading the word of God, and not just reading it for information, but reading it for transformation. Letting the Bible get inside of you. And, and I mean, think about it. Jesus was tempted. Isn't that hard to get your mind around? Like you've been through temptations. It says in Hebrews that Jesus was tempted in all ways. For guys, isn't it weird to think about that Jesus was tempted with lust? It says it right there in Hebrews. He was tempted in all ways. Jesus was tempted, but he never gave in to temptation. Says the devil tried to get him, but the devil had no hold on him. In other words, he resisted. He overcame the temptation. And it's interesting, when the Bible talks about the temptation of Jesus, it says that every time the devil came and tried to tempt Jesus, Jesus countered it with the word of God, the written word of God. Every time the devil would say, hey, why don't you do this? Jesus would answer and say, it is written. And the word of God kept Jesus from giving in to temptation and ultimately chased the devil away from even being able to tempt Jesus. The word of God is the weapon that God wants to give you so that you can fight back all the ways the devil is trying to fight you. He wants to arm you. Now, I don't want to get into a political debate, but let me tell you, I believe in Having weapons. I believe that, you know, having a gun in my home is, is good for my family. So in case, you know, somebody comes in and I don't want any emails or whatever. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't care about your view. You just respect my view, you know. But I, I believe in arming myself for the, for the protection of my family. Now with that in mind, God has given you a weapon to protect your spirit. It's called his word. And he wants you in it every day. So the more you're in the word, the more you are weaponized to come against the ways the devil wants to come against you. So, so the sword of the spirit, how, how do you use the word of God? I mean, just doing your devotions is, is powerful. Just being in the word and just get, meditating on the word and getting in the word because sometimes it may be not memorization, but it's just, it's just the spirit of the word that you read, you know, as, as we're reading through the book of Mark and as we've been in Matthew in the New Testament, we've been in the book of Job, right? We're, we're looking and, and, and just meditating on the word of God. By the way, I love Psalms. How many have been blessed with some psalms lately uh, in the devotion? So just being in the word every day is good. But there is something powerful about scripture memorization. And if our kids can do it, we can do it. And let me tell you, scripture memorization has helped shape me and helped me overcome some major temptations. One of the ones, and I've told you this before, but 1 John 4 verse 4 helped me overcome a lot of addiction in my life. And it's greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The devil would come and say, hey, Jim, why don't you give yourself over to that? And, and I learned, I said, okay, I'm gonna give the word of God like Jesus. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And then, you know, he was still there. You know, like, hey, come on, Jim, you can do this. They're like, no, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. First John chapter four, verse four. No, nah, man, you know, forget the word of God. You know, you could do this, this would be fun. No, greater is he that is in me. Wait a minute, then he that is in the world. Greater is he who is in me. Wait, greater is see Jesus is greater than this so you know what devil you can have whatever you you uh, you you have but you you don't have me because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world so he has empowered me to say no to you. And so the minute I begin quoting the word of God is the minute the devil became awfully quiet in that area of my life. Do you hear what God's saying to you tonight, church? Maybe you're struggling with fear, and 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. You know, fear is a natural thing that we all have, but fear can become sin if you let the desires take you away. Some of you, you're living in constant fear, and God says, I don't, I, I don't want you living that way. 
It's robbing you of the peace that I've given you. Some of you committing 2 Timothy 1.7, when the fear thought bubble comes up, like, what if, what if, what if? Hey, you know what, thought bubble? God hasn't given me a spirit of what if, of fear. He's given me a spirit of power. He's given me a spirit of love. He's given me a spirit of discipline. I don't need to listen to you. Go away. Go bother somebody else. Here's the third point. I got to get you guys out of here, and that is pursue your call. Pursue your call. You know, you all have a calling in your life. You all do. The the calling we all share together is that Jesus has commissioned us to go and share our faith with other people. You've been called to share your faith in Jesus with other people that don't yet know Jesus. We've all been called to do that. But I do believe beyond that, there's a special calling in your life. And here's the reality. You will overcome temptation quicker when you're pursuing your calling than if you weren't pursuing your calling at all. Let me, let me give you the scripture it says in, in uh, 2 Timothy. It says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteousness, uh, righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. See, it's harder to overcome temptation when you just stop doing something and don't replace it with something new. And and so a lot of people go back to old ways because they haven't filled in their old ways with new ways. And God came into your life not just to get you to heaven, but to get heaven into you. So that as heaven is moving through you, you will be so preoccupied with heaven moving through you, you won't want to go back to old ways. You're going to be so infatuated with God using you that it's not going to attract you anymore because you're saying, hey, what God is doing in me now is way better and, and gives me a better high than anything that I've ever done that, that made me high the other way. So... So I choose God. But here, the reason a lot of people go back is they're bored. They haven't replaced the things that they used to do with new things. And so a reason a lot of Christians keep going back to the old sin and old temptation is because they're not actively pursuing the calling of God for their lives. God wants you busy for his kingdom so that you will be so preoccupied doing the right things, you won't have any time anymore to do the wrong things. It's kind of like when I go to Cheesecake Factory, and I got to end with this. How many love some Cheesecake Factory? All right. Say, we don't have one here. Come and visit us in Thousand Oaks. We have one. All right. Just saying. But if you've ever been to Cheesecake Factory, you know the first thing you do when you open that menu is you go right to the cheesecake section. That is if you're normal, all right? If you're weird, maybe you don't. But like normal people, we go to Cheesecake Factory, we're going to check out the cheesecakes. And I mean, they have a lot of them. Snicker cheesecake? Come on, man. I'm going to make you hungry right now. But my favorite of all favorite cheesecakes is the key lime cheesecake. I just love me some key lime pie, so key lime cheesecake is even better because it's key lime and cheesecake, all right? So I, I've, I've looked at that menu so many times that I'm like, oh man, I'm so hungry. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to just devour the key lime cheesecake. Tara's like, hey, I'll just share. I'm like, no, you are not sharing with me. This is all mine. Get your own. And I can share yours, all right, and mine. But here's what happens. You order the meal. And so the meal comes and they even bring you some bread before the meal. And so if you've ever been to Cheesecake Factory, their portions are pretty large. So a lot of times you can't even finish the portions. And, and right, you're eating, you can't finish. There's still, you know, food on your plate. And, and the server comes over and says, okay, what would you like for dessert? And you're like, if I eat anything, I'm going to throw up right now. <laughs> but I thought you wanted cheesecake. I know that's what I said before, but I was hungry. I am like totally fool. I don't want the cheesecake because I have already eaten to capacity and if I get a cheesecake in me, it's going to end up all over this restaurant. So you don't want to that, you don't want to see that. So, so here's what I'm saying. See, when, when you start answering the call of God in your life, it fills you up. And when temptation comes and tries to pull you off course, you're so full of the ways of God you don't want to go back. You, you don't want to return to where you were because what you have is so much greater than what you left. 
And see, a lot of you would stop going back to what you left if you pursued the things that God wants you to pursue. And I don't know, maybe it's helping the kids. Maybe it's, it's going out and, and being a part of, of a, a service uh, project that we have going here. The bottom line is, find your calling and pursue it. And the best way I, I can encourage you to pursue your calling is get that connection card out that we have in the backs of the chairs. Take it home with you and pray and say, God, I know something on this list is going to help me pursue my calling. And so God, would you through your Holy Spirit show me to take that next step of my faith and get involved in a ministry? Because when you step into ministry, you're one step closer to pursuing your calling. And you might get into ministry and you're like, hmm, this is not what I thought it was. Hey, you know, that's okay. All right, just tell the leaders, just say, hey, I thought this is something I would do. But then don't just give up. Then go back to that connection card and say, okay, God, I'm gonna try something else. And then eventually you're gonna try something, you're gonna do it, and you're gonna be like, whoa, that was so incredible. I can't wait to do this again next week. And then you're pulling other people in, and it's just this uh, dynamic, powerful thing that you've introduced to your life. And then somebody taps on your shoulders and says, hey, you want to go and do some other stuff? And you're like, no way, man. God is using me in incredible, powerful ways. I would never want to go back to doing what I used to do because I found something so much better in my life right now. Does that make sense? We could go on and on. There's other ways to overcome temptation, but I'm telling you, these are biblical ways, but they're also practical ways that I've implemented into my life, and I've seen God give me victory after victory after victory after victory. And with every victory comes you stepping one step closer to unleashing all the promises of God that he's called for your life. And who doesn't want more promises of God coming into their life? I know I do. Don't let temptation stop you from receiving those promises. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, so much for your word tonight. I thank you for this letter that James writes to encourage us to say, hey, you want to really become spiritually mature, start resisting those desires, those impulses, those ways that just want to shortchange you and sabotage the work of God. And I know, God, as I'm preaching tonight, Lord, there, there's all kinds of temptations represented here. And there's people that maybe are, are sort of kind of contemplating it. And then there's people that are super being beaten up by it. But God, whatever place we're at with our temptation, God, would you bring a breakthrough to VBF tonight? Would you bring us a breakthrough, God, so that God, instead of us always being overcome in our temptation, Lord, that you would charge us and empower us to be the overcomers and the victors that you've called us to be because your spirit lives inside of us. God, we don't just want you a part of our life. Lord, we want you to be the commander. We want you to be the captain. We want you to be the king of our lives. And while everyone is praying, if you're here tonight and you've never made that step, to let Jesus be your commander, to be your captain. Tonight, I've got to dismiss you because we're out of time, but if you want to make that decision, I want to invite you up here to one of these prayer leaders and say, man, tonight's my night. I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I, I want him to be the captain. Maybe some of you have been running from God and, and, and this has been your first time back at church in a long time and you're just like, man, this message is for me. I need to give my life back to God tonight. I, I need to return him to his proper rank in my life like maybe he was when I was in high school or when I was in, in elementary school. Tonight is your night, my friend. Don't leave here without allowing someone, one of our leaders, to be able to pray with you and pray for you. God, wherever we're at tonight, help us. Help us, God. Whether it's submitting to you, feeding the Spirit, or pursuing our call, God, give us that revelation of that calling. Be with us and speak to us the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, come up here, but we'll see you later. Give your neighbor a high five. You're dismissed.